why don't we hop in? We're going to do a quick round of intros, and then Luigi will lead us here in the discussion. So wanted to kick it over to our two special guests to introduce themselves, kind of how they got started in crypto and with Yeti, and then we'll take it from there. So Talent, why don't you get us started with an intro? Yeah, definitely. Um, and thank you guys for hosting. Uh, so I first got into crypto in 2016. Um, back then, I used to play um, a bit of Counter-Strike Global Offensive, and there um, people traded I, people traded like CSGO skins. So they're essentially kind of like kind of like the first iteration of the NFTs, essentially kind of uh, different types of like gun skins or knife skins that you could use in the video game and had a uh, pretty high value. Uh, so back then I traded some pretty expensive skins that were kind of like in the $10,000 uh, plus range. And kind of when you sold these skins uh, for dollars, uh, most people were international. So kind of places like Dubai, China, uh, Denmark, and whatnot. Um, so international wire fees uh, via PayPal or, or, or the bank was qu quite expensive. Uh, so people use Bitcoin. Um, and that's kind of when I dived into the technology, uh, learned a lot about it. Um, and kind of kind of started diving into crypto. Um, but kind of after that point, um, I'd been dabbling on the crypto on the side, uh, but I'd been working um, in traditional startups for a couple of years um, doing product management. Um, and then kind of, yeah, the, the kind of this year uh, is when I really kind of pursued um, building something uh, with Yeti Finance. And that was kind of because uh, a lot of the different collateral types that I wanted to borrow against, uh, like S. Joe, uh, WMMO at the time, uh, weren't collateralizable on any kind of lending platform uh, on Avalanche. And um, that's kind of led us to where we are right now. Awesome. Yeah, that's great. Good. And that backstory really helps. Uh, Robo, how about you? You want to give us a, a quick intro? Yeah, happy to do that. And uh, yeah, glad to be here. Uh, regarding my Yeti uh, journey into crypto, kind of, I've been around this space for a couple of years now. Um, Uh, back in 2019, I was working on the Bitcoin Lightning Network. Um, after that, kind of switched over to Ethereum, uh, building options, uh, other protocols, and kind of Yeti Finance was uh, the first thing I created on Avalanche, uh, along with Xerox Talent and Truco. Um, so we started this back in October, kind of with the vision of bringing something really new and innovative to the space, as well as kind of leaving our footprint here. Um, so we're really happy to have made it this far and uh, to be building on Avalanche. Awesome. Welcome. Well, glad to, glad to have you as part of the community as well. So really excited to get to talk to you both today. Uh, Luigi, our head of DeFi, you want to give a quick hello? Hey, everybody. Uh, been looking forward to this for a while. So um, have gotten to know the Yeti guys for, I want to say, I don't know, maybe eight months or so now. It's been a while. And, uh, you know, for anybody who doesn't know me, uh, head of DeFi here at Ava Labs, uh, been here for a little bit over a year, uh, really focused on building out the DeFi ecosystem, but also really just the Avalanche uh, community ecosystem as a whole. So look forward to this chat today in particular. I don't know if you had anything uh, you wanted to start off with, Kyle. Uh, if not, then... No, no, take it away. We just wanted to do some intros and, and um, I think we want to maximize our time with our two guests here. So uh, go for it. Sure. So... Um, I think one thing that I would be helpful for everybody to understand is first, I know you gave a little bit of insight, but you know, how did the idea in particular about Yeti finance come about amongst the team? How did you guys sit around and decide like, this is what, out of all the things you could build, this is what we want to build. And in this way and on Avalanche, uh, can you just give us a little bit of insight into how those decisions, um, were made? Yeah, Definitely. Um, I think it was kind of back in um, 21, 2021 uh, summer, uh, we were using a lot of different DeFi protocols, um, kind of being DGENs, uh, especially with kind of the coming of Avalanche Rush. There were a, there were a bunch of new protocols um, that were playing around with, you know, um, kind of like Wonderland at the time, uh, Joe, staking Joe, um, and getting um, some solid yields there. Um, and kind of the problem that we saw was there was a lot of kind of these high quality collaterals, or even just collaterals with a you know, a big market cap, uh, for example, WMMO um, at the time had, you know, like hundreds of millions of dollars of a circling market cap. Um, and the problem was there was like nowhere to borrow against these things. You know, people wanted to be DGENs. Uh, they wanted to kind of lever up uh, on different assets and get high yield. Um, and we were we were those people. 
uh, we would just sit around on Abracadabra and, and just refresh uh, to see if there's more WMMO capacity. Um, and usually the, the, there wasn't. There was such high borrowing demand for that. Um, and, you know, kind of any borrowing protocol doesn't want to be ex overexposed uh, to one asset. And kind of at the time, we only really saw two protocols um, allowing borrowing against kind of more um, interest-bearing assets or more kind of um, estor historic assets. And that was kind of Abracadabra, uh, which was on Avalanche, and then uh, Rari, um, which was on ETH. Uh, and kind of the problem we saw with Rari is that um, allowing users to create um, their own pools, um, it's a very good proposition, uh, but it could lead to kind of big exploits when users um, you know, use the wrong Oracle, um, have the wrong parameters. And we thought a centralized approach to this problem of allowing users to borrow against kind of popular, interest-bearing, um, historic collateral was uh, more of one um, from a protocol level uh, rather than just totally permissionless. Um, and there we kind of took a, took a deep dive in Abracadabra. We were playing around with our GitHub. Um, we kind of saw some inherent problems with the design, even though we thought it was a really good barring protocol, uh, kind of the main one being um, uh, the stablecoin mechanics. I think for, for MIM, uh, there's no hard peg mechanism. Uh, so when MIM's trading under $1, kind of the incentive to get MIM back to peg uh, is to get you know people with outstanding MIM loans to buy MIM for $0.97 cents on the market um, and then repay their loan. And they have, there's some kind of factors to this where they can increase uh, repayment, such as raising interest rates. Um, kind of like a, a central bank would. Um, but we didn't really think this was very decentralized and not uh, not the best approach. Uh, but one thing we did take away from it was the stablecoin model is very powerful. Uh, essentially, you can issue your own currency uh, in a safe, over-collateralized manner. So, you know, someone can put a dollar ten cents of, let's say, um, AVAX on Yeti uh, and mint one dollar of YUSD. Um, and this kind of meant that, you know, kind of like most um, lending protocols uh, right now in DeFi, uh, you didn't have to pay, you don't have to pay uh, a depositor, someone for, um, you know, putting collateral that you lend out. Um, and this is very powerful because how most kind of lending protocols work is the amount that people pay as borrowers for interest is, a, you know, a spread on top of what the protocol pays depositors. Um, and kind of with the stablecoin lending model, uh, we didn't have to worry about that. Essentially, if someone you know wanted to borrow against uh, any type of asset in an over collateralized manner, uh, we could simply issue a stablecoin that was backed by um, the underlying you know deposits. Um, and we've definitely done a lot of kind of work in terms of our risk mechanisms um, and liquidation mechanisms to ensure there's a safe threshold uh, in between the deposit um, price of the asset uh, and the outstanding loan. So if it does drop you know below a certain mark, then 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 the loan gets liquidated. But overall, we think the stablecoin model is kind of the future and something that's very novel um, in DeFi compared to a traditional uh, lending market. Got it. And so um, thanks for that. So if we distill it at a higher level, because I'm not sure like you know, how deep some of the audience is here, um, you know, what does Yeti provide that potentially other protocols such as Abracadabra, um, um, you know, or, or Rari, do not at a high level. Yeah, definitely. So essentially, we're um, one across margin lending protocol. Uh, so that means you can um, borrow against multiple assets at once. Um, so you have one one outstanding debt position um, for your, your portfolio versus uh, multiple individual positions. So that means if you have 50% um, AVAX, 20% ETH, 10% Bitcoin, 20% um, Joe, um, if Joe drops 25%, um, you won't get liquidated because you have Bitcoin, ETH, AVAX um, in your portfolio. So that means kind of you can borrow against volatile assets a lot more safely uh, because kind of price swings among individual assets uh, won't matter as long as your overall portfolio um, is solid. Uh, the second thing is we allow uh, very high leverage. Um, so we have very low minimum collateral ratios, which means kind of the amount um, that you need to have in Yeti for the outstanding loan uh, is kind of it's the lowest in DeFi. So that allows you to do some very interesting things like um, building up a 21x leverage position on something like Aave USDC um, or up to 11x leverage on something like SAVAX or AVAX. 
Um, and kind of the uh, the third thing is that we allow uh, users to borrow against um, almost 30 different collateral types. Um, and a lot of these assets are not collateralizable or borrow, uh, borrowable um, anywhere. So things like um, uh, SJO, uh, Trader Joe LP tokens, uh, Benchy assets, Aave assets. Uh, and this is kind of the really key value add of Yeti. Um, there's a bunch of high quality collateral out there. Um, let's say like deposited assets on Benchy um, or Curve LP tokens. But these assets um, don't have a place where they can be borrowed against. Um, and this is kind of what Yeti enables. We allow users to borrow essentially any high quality uh, big market cap asset on Avalanche uh, safely. Uh, and this is all for 0% accruing interest. Uh, it's just a one-time deposit fee and a one-time borrowing fee. Awesome. And so, yeah, so, so the ability to take tokens that are earning interest, deposit them into the protocol, and then borrow against those as collateral in a safe way, it, 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 you know, is one of the things that Yeti has, has, has brought to the fold here in Avalanche. Now, um, in terms of like uh, how you guys design this protocols and some of the other ones you built on top of, uh, like, is, is this new code? Uh, is this like thing something that you've designed from scratch? Is this you know a fork? Is this something that you've built on top of others? Could you give you know you know the community a little bit of insight into how much of this is native and new to Avalanche, and how much of this is new to DeFi as a whole versus um, maybe you know forking an existing protocol? Yeah, I can get into that a little bit. Um, so with Yeti, we uh, were inspired quite a bit based on liquidity and their kind of economic mechanisms and their ability to offer low collateral ratios in a, in a very secure way. And so for Yeti Finance, we kind of built off their code base. Um, so start off with liquidity, which is this lending protocol on Ethereum only offers lending against ETH. And we built out quite a bit of infrastructure to allow liquidity to uh, accept multiple collateral types in a cross collateralized fashion, which is what we're doing with Yeti. Um, so that process uh, took quite a, quite a bit of time, as well as I had to undergo a lot of economic security reviews. Um, but that's kind of our original contribution. And on top of that, we built out uh, this auto compounding architecture. So when you deposit an asset on Yeti, um, we automatically claim your farming rewards and auto compound them. Uh, so essentially, you can maximize your yield generated. And it's kind of like we've built a borrowing pro protocol plus beefy finance or yield yak uh, right within Yeti, uh, automatically uh, free to use for our users. Awesome. Yeah, no, I think that's a really good description. And, you know, I think one of the things that's worth mentioning here, uh, given the recent events in DeFi and, and across other chains, you know, with, with, with Luna and Terra and sort of the issues that, that happen with respect to UST, is for you to explain the YUSD stablecoin to the community. Um, you know, I think there's probably some apprehension to new stablecoins. Uh, we even saw, you know, Tether, USDT, be pegged a significant amount, you know, and that's been around since since I started in the space. And so uh, that's a long time. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, why don't you give a little bit of insight into the design of YUSD, why it's different than something like UST, um, you know, for everybody here. Yep. So YUSD is actually an over-collateralized stablecoin. And this is kind of critical to the way we want to build Yeti. And it's what keeps YSD stable. So YSD kind of builds on the, the same mechanisms that back uh, MakerDAO or Liquidity, or these other, other really well-established over-collateralized stablecoins. Um, so with Yeti Finance, the collateral in the platform kind of backs the value of YSD. There's always more collateral on Yeti than... YOSD in circulation. And um, this is kind of the tried and true model for DeFi, and it's what works for stablecoins. Um, on top of that, that uh, really well-established model, we also have kind of hard peg mechanisms to make sure YSD stays pegged at $1. And these mechanisms are what allowed us to survive the, the Luna collapse, the all the uncertainty, the, uh, the exit, the flee of capital from crypto uh, during that week. Um, and so on the hard peg mechanism side, we allow any, anyone who holds YSD to trade it in for collateral on a one-to-one -one basis. So one YSD can be traded in for $1 of collateral. 
And this is called a redemption. And so with the collateral in our system, it's a lot of uh, stable coins, yield bearing stable coins like USDC, USDT, so really high quality assets, as well as a bit of Bitcoin, ETH, and AVAX. Um, so this redemption mechanism is really make sure that YSD uh, stays pegged. And if there's excessive sell pressure or for whatever reason, there's um, a slight drop in the YSD value, anyone, including us who, who are running these arbitrage bots, can take YSD off the market and redeem it for collateral. Um, and in doing so, it's a profitable arbitrage opportunity and it's a way to bring YSD back to peg. Perfect. Uh, I think it's a good example. Over collateralized, yeah, it means more. There's more uh, dollars in collateral in the system versus the amount of uh, YSD so that they can always redeem the collateral against and cover the loans uh, versus something like UST, which was, you know, uh, collateralized with, with, with a different type of token. Um, so I think that was a good explanation. Uh, I think one thing that, you know, would be interesting for people to understand as well. Um, you know, and this is obviously not financial advice and uh, not the prerequisite this stuff, but, uh, why don't you explain the Yeti token, um, its significance to the application and, you know, any potential plans, uh, with respect to that and how, it, how the Yeti token fits into to Yeti finance. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, again, yeah, not financial advice, but I can, I can get into a bit of that now. Um, so we have two tokens, obviously. We have our stablecoin, YSD, and then the Yeti token. And Yeti token is kind of a token that unlocks more value within the Yeti ecosystem, uh, as well as will provide governance power in the near future. Um, so for right now, the Yeti token is going out to our users. It's, it's used to incentivize usage of Yeti, including providing stablecoin liquidity, as well as depositing in our stability pool. Uh, which is a way to kind of secure the protocol and earn yield. And we've kind of had this VE Yeti roadmap of introducing more and more utility for the Yeti token. And I can provide some alpha on that um, here today. Uh, but for right now, the Yeti token is, is primarily utilized for uh, buyer LPs to kind of boost their emissions, to get extra rewards and to get extra rewards for pro providing liquidity as well as uh, kind of be incentivized to, to keep doing that. Um, and the next utilities that are coming after the Yeti token, first of all, we have boosting on the stability pool, which is another similar mechanism to kind of drive our emissions toward the most loyal um, and active users in our community. And secondly, we're introducing uh, this new thing called the Yeti Finance Advisory Committee. And this will be the first time that protocol revenues will actually be distributed to Yeti token holders and kind of this governance-esque mechanism. Um, so this is kind of a great catalyst and a great opportunity for Yeti finance holders to really capitalize on on their Yeti holdings. And just to give kind of a brief overview, we're going to get into it uh, in an article and uh, kind of further down the line, but just a brief overview. Um, the advisory committee is, is kind of like a governance system where uh, if you have Yeti tokens, you can voice your opinions on the protocol and uh, get compensated in YOSD in our stablecoin for doing so. So that's a high level, but yeah, look forward to more details on that. Oh, wow. Um, so we just got a little alpha, it sounds like. That's exciting. Uh, it'll be good to see, I think, a little bit more governance and, and, and sort of um, the ability to direct Yeti holders to, to be able to enact that. It's going to be pretty exciting. So looking forward to hearing a little bit more on that. Um, thank you for that. So. So the other thing I'd like to ask you is, you know, part of Yeti finance and, and its attractiveness is the ability to accept a lot of different types of collateral. So, you, you know, like you accept S Joe, right. And w w what that means effectively is like S Joe is stable Joe on, on trader Joe, which means that if you lock up Joe on that platform, you can earn um, the trading fees in USDC. So that's quite nice. Um, but then you could take your S Joe, go to Yeti finance and then uh, borrow against that. Right. So um, that's one example of collateral. The other ones are banky tokens. So if you deposit your assets in Banky or Aave, you can further deposit them in Yeti and borrow against them. So the ability to um, sort of work with other projects is like tantamount to the Yeti success. Uh, what are your thoughts on like future collaterals um, and things you could add? And also like, 
uh, how you go about, you know, searching for these new ones and, and the options are available. Yeah. So uh, kind of with our collaterals, we, in the process around that is really, we really want to bring value to our users and uh, kind of prioritize the collaterals that have high borrowing demand and that are high market have assets on Avalanche. Um, so we've covered a lot of them. So we have Aave, Trader Joe LP tokens, Banky uh, deposited assets, as well as Curve LP tokens, and kind of our base assets like Wheat and Wavex. Um, but going forward, there's a couple really exciting integrations that have been highly requested. So I can name three right now. Uh, we're starting off with Chi S AVAX. So that's deposited S AVAX on, on Banky. So not only are you earning the uh, kind of validator rewards for uh, staking in S AVAX, but you're also earning uh, some yield from Banky. So that's the liquid staking token S AVAX, right? Exactly. Li- liquid staking on Avalanche. Um, so that's a great integration coming soon. Uh, so it'll be collateral on Yeti. You can borrow against it and and then kind of have liquid YST to do what you want. And outside of that, we also have uh, Platypus LP tokens coming soon to Yeti Finance. So you'll be able to deposit, um, your, let's say, USDC on Platypus and borrow against it with Yeti and, and earn those PTP emissions um, while kind of having a liquid alternative. And the final thing I wanted to mention was also GLP. Uh, so this is a kind of interesting asset from from GMX, a uh, kind of popular derivatives platform, and it's very high yield. And I think uh, that'll also be, also be uh, quite exciting. And we have kind of more integrations with GMX coming, uh, even outside of that. Awesome, yeah. And and I guess on top of that, can you just let you know maybe talk a little bit about some of the recent partnerships you've announced, like uh, with you know Vector. Um, Platypus and, and and Trader Joe, I think, initially. Yeah, to get into that bit, kind of, we've always taken this this approach of collaborating with everyone. And, you know, since the beginning, really integrated ourselves with the Avalanche community. And kind of part of, part of that has enabled us to, to kind of um, get, some, get some really powerful partnerships um, after we went to mainnet. So, uh, firstly, we're, we're quite close to the Trader Joe team. Um, we have kind of our double Joe, Joe rewards farms on, on Yeti AVAX, which I think have been, uh, relatively popular with our users and on the VTX side, um, we're also doing joint rewards with them. So you can deposit, uh, USDC or, or soon YUSD on their platform to earn double rewards. That's Yeti incentives as well as vector incentives. Um, this has been great for us kind of in controlling our, our emission rate and also, um, kind of having further joint collaboration across the ecosystem. And a final partnership I want to mention is also with the Platypus team, uh, who we've also uh, been quite supportive of us kind of since, since the very early days. And on the Platypus side, we also have joint emissions there with Platypus and Yeti incentives on our uh, YSD liquidity pools. Um, so another great opportunity there. Awesome. So, you know, before we kind of like dive into some of the other uh, items, I wanted to just ask, because we do have a lot of the Avalanche community sitting in here, um, you know, why did you guys ultimately decide to build on Avalanche? Um, You know, it sounds like you've had experience working on Ethereum. Uh, You've also looked at protocols on Avalanche and it sounds like you guys had your your bit of fun on on Wonderland in those days. Um, you know, what made you decide to build on Avalanche and, and kind of how has that experience been so far, you know, in general? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I think my background was in building consumer facing products. Um, I think that's something that I really enjoy um, in tech is that you could, you know, put out something in the world and have thousands of people use it. Um, and this is the same thing with blockchain uh, and decentralized finance, it, even a grander scale. Um, in DeFi, um, you're not kind of um, blocked by things like countries, um, things like, uh, you know, having to sign up, uh, you know, with an account and doing some really um, crazy KYC or onboarding process. It's just something very simple. You s- simply connect your, your wallet um, and you interact with the protocol. Um, and that's the thing that we wanted to do 
um, and focus on DeFi as well. We wanted to really build something that was not kind of made uh, and used by only like a couple, you know, hundred whales on ETH. Uh, we wanted something that could be used by tens of thousands of users. Uh, and we saw Avalanche as the best place uh, to do that. Um, in that Avalanche had very low fees, a very big um, kind of user base uh, spanning across the globe, you know, from US, uh, Turkey, uh, Philippines, Vietnam. Uh, we saw a ton of usage just across the world. Um, and that was something that was very attractive uh, to us. We think decentralized finance um, in the long run is something that's going to enable um, people all over the world to get access to global and advanced uh, financial services. Um, and at the time, we didn't think um, ETH was the best place to do that, um, as it wasn't very accessible um, to pretty much anyone that, you know, wanted to use DeFi um, for uh, actual uh, financial service uh, means. And yeah, I think Avalanche as well had some kind of really big drivers. Um, one was the Avalanche Rush program, which we saw um, and kind of experienced bring a lot of total value locked um, to the chain. Uh, we also talked to um, Philip, um, and also, also Luigi, uh, pretty early, early on in in our decision to build on Avalanche. Uh, we had a friend um, that invested pretty on pr pretty early on um, in uh, Avalabs, um, I think it was their Series A. Um, and we kind of had talked to her about her experience with the A uh, Avalanche team, um, the blockchain, uh, the community there. Um, and I think that kind of the last thing was really how collaborative the environment was. Uh, I think when we just started to, you know, really build on the chain, we reached out to builders like CryptoFish, um, and the team at Trader Joe, uh, who are really happy um, and helpful in kind of navigating the Avalanche ecosystem, giving us words of advice, uh, telling us about their experience, uh, and kind of everything in combination uh, really solidified the choice to build on Avalanche. Uh, it was the tech, the user base, uh, the team behind Avalanche, uh, as well as kind of the growth uh, and real adoption of decentralized finance protocols by uh, the greater mass on this chain. It looks like Luigi got moved to listener. Yeah, I just added him back on. We'll give it a second here. But yeah, thanks for for breaking that down. It's very exciting. Um, Luigi, you got it back. Yeah, on I'm back. Sorry. Uh, Twitter doesn't allow a phone call to come in without uh, disrupting the whole Twitter oh, Spaces no. experience. <laughs> uh, this is quite quite interesting. Now, thank you for that. Thank you for that answer. And I, and, and I got the gist of it. And it's quite the, it's nice to hear that you've been able to get integrated into the ecosystem and. And everything, everything's going well there. Um, I'd like to hear a little bit about, like, you know, what you're, you know, a, a little bit about first the team, um, you know, to to what you want to share, and and then you know what your plans are for for Yeti Finance going forward. So we have this application. You'll continue to add collaterals as, as needed. Um, you know, where do you guys want to take this application? Like, you know, what are the aspirations? Yeah, definitely. I can take the team part and then Ruby had to go a little bit more into a roadmap and vision. Um, yeah, so uh, we started off as a, a core team of seven. Uh, since then, we've expanded. Uh, now we're about 10 or 11-ish. Um, and kind of with the breakdown of the initial core seven team is six engineers um, and one kind of person focused on business, uh, which is me. Uh, and in terms of engineering background, it's pretty diverse. Uh, we have people like Robo Yeti, who was working on options on ETH, uh, whether hedging derivatives on Bitcoin uh, network. Uh, we had one teammate um, kind of work in the NFT slash blockchain entertainment space, uh, working on a really popular NFT game there, uh, as well as one teammate uh, working in uh, smart contract auditing, um, as well as a couple other people with um, no real DeFi working experience, more just kind of uh, hobby-like uh, side projects. So we had one teammate uh, who was working at Google doing ML um, and had been working with Robo Yeti uh, on kind of a mini project before Yeti. Um, and another one who um, was working at um, kind of medical technology startups. Um, so yeah, it, it's honestly quite interesting how, how we all came together um, and, and, and did Yeti. I think a part of it is that um, we had known each other from college and had all kind of known 
we were you know, smart, um, ambitious people that wanted to do something big, uh, especially in, in the startup space. Um, and I think kind of the idea of crypto um, and decentralized finance is kind of pervasive uh, between different industries. It's something that's very uh, global and uh, kind of, let's say, uh, very relatable in, in terms of human nature. People want kind of uncensorable uh, money, control over their own assets, uh, and be able to transact with people all over the world without having a bunch of barriers to entry. And I think building the DeFi space uh, was something very attractive to us uh, for that reason, as well as, um, you know, the industry is doing quite well and it, it's very lucrative. Um, and yeah, I think kind of everything in combination uh, brought us together um, to build Yeti Finance. And then I think yeah. the second question was around like, you know, where do you see, where do you want to take Yeti in the future? You know, what are your aspirations for this, et cetera? Yeah, I can get into that a little bit. Um, kind of, we we started Yeti with t- trying to build kind of the next generation borrowing protocol. And I think a lot of ways we achieved that um, with kind of this cross collateralized model that, that offers borrowing against not only uh, kind of your basic assets, but also yield bearing collaterals and um, assets that people really want to, to lever up on. Um, so really proud to, to bring it to Avalanche, but kind of the roadmap going forward, not only do we want to expand and really perfect our current borrowing protocol and kind of expand cross-chain with that when the time's right, but also build out more primitives uh, within the Yeti ecosystem. Um, so we started out with, you know, we had the borrowing protocol, and then within that we had this auto-compounding product, uh, which is quite valuable to, to farmers, to DeFi users uh, who are borrowing with Yeti. But uh, kind of our, our dev team, our, our uh, potential for development does really stop there. Um, so kind of we're excited to, to introduce more primitives and as well as bring in more utilities for YSD, um, both in terms of integrating with other protocols, whether it's derivatives or options, and also building out those primitives even in-house and tying the value that they generate back to the Yeti token as well. It's kind of going forward. Short term, it's more collateral integrations really perfecting the borrowing protocol. Uh, but long term, kind of, you can expect a lot more to come out of this team, and we really believe in the promise of DeFi and and believe in the fact that this is going to be a growing space in the long term and be host to a large percentage of overall global finance. And so, when you have that kind of thesis, it makes a lot of sense to uh, really go heads down whether whether the markets are up or down and um, try to try to generate value and uh, keep innovating. And kind of that's what we're here to do. Awesome. Yeah, I'd love to hear that. I think you guys got, you know, a, a lot to still tackle in this space. I'd love to, to talk a little bit more uh, about that. I think we're going to leave room for some questions at the end. But before we do, I think you kind of alluded to something that, you know, is not, you know, a Yeti finance specific item. But you guys are builders in the space. DeFi and crypto has taken you know, not only crypto, but macro has taken a decent hit with respect to price, but also, you know, I think activity as well, which ten, tends tends to follow price in this space. Um, just kind of curious what you guys are seeing as it relates to, uh, you know, the recent events over the past month or so in, in, in terms of the environment in DeFi specifically, um, you know, and kind of, you know, what, you know, what you guys think about that as builders in the space, as somebody who's, you know, obviously trying to, number one, make a little bit in living, but also build a project that, that can ultimately get adoption. Um, you know, well, how do you take a look at the environment outside and, and, and what are your thoughts about, you know, kind of what you're seeing? Yeah, that's a good question. I think for us with Yeti, uh, we were always focused on kind of doing something fun of uh, building something big. Um, the money never really came into mind uh, in terms of things like token price um, and whatnot. It was definitely, you know, it's definitely a plus, you know, that DeFi is a very lucrative space. Um, and I think it will continue to be. Um, but I think it kind of in the, in the long term of building any startup, um, you have to have you know, a 10 year time horizon. Um, you know, crypto is kind of unique in that, you know, you launch a project, it could have a liquid, liquid token market, you know, within a year. 
Uh, but most traditional startups, it takes um, 10 plus years to IPO. Um, and that's kind of how we think about Yeti. Um, even though you might have a liquid token, um, you know, within a year of building the product, the focus is really just building a big enduring company uh, that can run autonomously, um, you know, for, you know, hopefully, you know, hundreds of years, you know, the, the life of how long blockchain keeps on continuing. Um, and that's kind of what we focused on. We focused on building um, enduring systems um, that work at scale um, and even during rough market conditions. Um, so kind of during the UST and Luna um, collapse, you know, you kind of saw hundreds of, you know, uh, or not hundreds of millions, yeah, yeah, a hundred billion dollars, you know, exit DeFi. And, and there was hundreds of millions of dollars of, you know, TVL leaving Yeti, um, a lot in the form of liquidations uh, for assets that dropped, you know, 20%, 30%, 50%. I think the important thing here uh, was the system held up well. Um, you know, under collateralized loans, we were getting liquidated. Um, the YUSD was pretty much at peg um, at 99 cents to a dollar uh, during the whole kind of USD Luna fiasco. Um, even as UST, you know, dropped to or USDT dropped to 95 cents, um, and, and and a decent amount of users got liquidated on Yeti. Uh, the protocol still continued to work, um, and this is something that um, we're quite happy about. Um, it kind of proved to us that we built. Um, you know, enduring uh, durable system that can even survive, you know, a huge crypto, you know, market drawdown um, and liquidation cascade. Uh, I think for us, kind of the future going forward is just to continue building uh, products that have product market fit. Um, and this is important because these products can run in the bear market uh, or, or bull market. Uh, they do equally fine in both. And it's something that's more independent of the market conditions. Um, as a protocol, we made a good amount of revenue um, from kind of the you know the first month uh, where we probably exceeded over five hundred million dollars uh, of YUSD borrowing volume, and that generated quite amount of quite a bit of fees um, that we can use to continue paying the developers, um, paying for smart contract audits, um, and continue building um, in crypto in a compliant way. And that that includes things like you know hiring a regulatory team. Um, you know we have an international law firm that works with us, uh, external general counsel, um, tax partners. Um, that we kind of use um, to really, you know, make sure that we're building in a correct and right way uh, for, let's say, when regulation does, um, you know, come harder in crypto, um, that we can work with regulators um, and, and partners um, in a way that, you know, fits the paradigm of the future. Um, you know, we're not totally um, absent in the way that we, we just want to do things our, our own way. We're really cognizant of what's happening in the market um, and we adapt our product. Um, and for that, so whether that means, you know, inter integrating with more um, kind of safe, um, you know, less risky or less, less risky, less DJ assets, um, that's what we'll do. And we'll continue adjusting and building, um, you know, as the market changes and it goes up and down. Awesome. Yeah, it's great to hear. I mean, I think we've, we've heard similar feedback from a lot of a lot of the, the avalanche builders and, and continue to see new ones that are coming up in DeFi. Um, you know, continuing this like macro uh, question I kind of have, uh, we talked a little bit about, you know, Yeti finance um, and, and sort of the future for that. We didn't talk a ton about YUSD um, and, and sort of the plans for that token. I mean, it's a stable coin in the ecosystem uh, sort of similar to a system like maker uh, and die. And also, uh, you know, as an over, over collateralized stable coin, uh, what are some of the upcoming plans for YUSD? Uh, what will people be able to do with it? Uh, and, and sort of what's your vision for that coin? Yeah. For any stable coin kind of, it's super important to have use cases and get it integrated into whatever ecosystem, um, it's in. And so kind of that's a super important focus for us, for us and Yeti, um, especially on the biz dev side. Um, so specifically, um, we really need YSD to kind of, we want YSD to be really integrated in the Avalanche ecosystem and kind of be the default stable coin uh, that you go to when you're, when you're uh, getting into the Avalanche ecosystem, much as DAI might be that for, for Ethereum. And so what that means is getting more integrated into lending markets on Avalanche, uh, into derivatives platforms, options platforms, whatever needs collateral, uh, we want YSD to be there. Um, so kind of that's that's like the vision for YSD. And uh, going forward, we also want YSD to get 
more and more integrated onto other chains as well. Um, so that means even before Yeti Finance as a, as a protocol gets deployed on Arbitrum or Optimism, we want YSD to be there, uh, bridged over and uh, kind of deposited as collateral on these platforms. Uh, so the more integrations we get for YSD, the more we can scale our borrowing volume and the more we can scale Yeti. Uh, so that's kind of why it's super critical. And um, so why isn't YUSD on like uh, a Banky or an Aave right now? Yeah, actually, in order to get those integrations, we need a chain like Oracle. Um, so kind of we're working on that on the on the, the back end of things. Uh, kind of it's just a, a bit of a slow process from them just to make sure everything's secure, uh, which is you know completely fine on their end. Um, they need to get integrated with uh, some of the Avalanche exchanges. And after that process is complete, uh, we'll soon have a chain link Oracle for YSD. And from there, uh, kind of the integrations can can flow quite smoothly, whether it's Banky or Aave. Um, some of these huge integrations, which will uh, be syncs for YSD and and open up even more borrowing capacity, uh, which is really yep. exciting. That's great. Yeah, and that's going to be important for you guys because... Um, being able to to borrow against it, uh, you know, and, and and having some of the more institutional uh, money come into the space, evaluate YUSD as an option, uh, and then ultimately, once they evaluate it, they'll likely, um, based on the model that you've, you've built, they'll likely LP um, large amounts of it. Right? And so then, that, that, you know, I think it's all part of things that just take time, uh, need to be integrated within the ecosystem, and then that'll be super beneficial for you guys. So I look forward to, uh, to kind of seeing why USD get a little bit more integrated in the ecosystem. It is a native avalanche, uh, stable coin. We've been asked about that for a long time. And so excited to kind of, uh, see that get integrated. Um, and, and I guess the, you know, I want to leave time for questions since we have a good audience here. So, uh, one of the, one of the last questions I have, for you, for you guys in particular, is like um, DeFi started with this, you know, uh, with the with the AMM and the ability to swap tokens and sort of uh, yield farming, and then moved on to this uh, DeFi 2.0. And you know, there's been de- various iterations. You know, what what are you seeing, or what are you guys thinking will be the next sort of uh, advent in DeFi, and what's sort of going to get people invigorated and excited again about you know some of these really cool building blocks that have been built but um you know being able to kind of use them at scale what do you think's next in DeFi? yes it's a great question i think one thing we have been excited about is uh really seeing the way that nfts and, and gaming has brought in a lot of consumer interest um kind of normie interest into crypto I think that will be an important way that um, we bring in more users and kind of onboard them to the more technical aspects, whether it's uh, financial primitives or uh, different protocols. So I think gaming NFTs is uh, where we'll see a lot of the, the uh, will be a lot of the way where we see a lot more adoption of crypto. And I think Avalanche has been doing a great job of kind of fostering that ecosystem and all that adoption will kind of bring in more capital into, into the DeFi side of things as well. Yeah. So I guess something like uh platypus's upcoming NFT launch, right? Where you have, you actually provide utility to the, to the NFTs um, that can, that can actually be used within the DeFi aspect of the application. Like I think their NFTs allow you to boost your VEPTP or do various things with them. So a little bit more strategy game on top of, uh, the DeFi is that is that kind of what you're referring to? Yeah, things along those lines, as well as uh, kind of more collaborations on a deeper level with, uh, let's say, gaming applications, GameFi applications, and and DeFi applications that maybe used to be standalone entities, but kind of get further integrated. Awesome! Awesome! Yeah, I mean, I think given the audience we have, uh, guys, before we go to questions, is there anything in particular that we didn't touch on that you wanted uh, to talk to the audience about? Or, or, or should we go to questions with Kyle? Uh, nothing from my side. I'm ready to go to questions. Yeah, yeah I'll take a few questions mind. here. Nice. Um, yeah, let's take a, take a few questions from the audience here. So if you want to ask our special guests a question, go ahead and request to be a speaker. 
A couple reminders. One, you have to be on mobile to be a speaker on Spaces. So if you're on your phone, go ahead and request. I'll let you up. You can come off mute, ask one question for, for Talon and Robo here. The other thing is um, because we're, we, you know, we want to maximize our time with them, make sure all the questions are focused on Yeti finance and what they're bringing to the Avalanche ecosystem. I know there's a million things going on. Everyone wants to talk about everything, but let's keep the questions focused here. So start calling them up one by one. I see people here that were requesting a little bit ago. Uh, we'll, we'll ask, uh, see if AVAX Chicken has a question. Hey guys. Hey, thank you so much, Luigi and, and Yeti team. Um, first off, big fan. Like, I think what you guys are doing is, I mean, it's just, it's so exciting. I don't, I've never seen anything like it. Um, Luigi, this is a question for you. And then just really quick for, for the team, you know, my use case, and I, I'm glad you guys brought it up is I'm heavily invested in chicken. I have a lot of Bitcoin. I have to move my Bitcoin off my cold wallet to Coinbase, convert it to AVAX and then move it to Trader Joe to convert it, get, then move it to Yeti in order to, you know, borrow. What What's the status with the Bitcoin bridge for AVAX? That's one. And then the second is, why are you, and you guys just mentioned it about the gaming. I'm heavily invested in chicken. I love the fact what you guys have done because I don't have to pay interest so I can borrow against my existing collateral, my crypto to invest more into games like chicken. So what are you guys doing to play more with these types of NFTs, which I think, in my opinion, Avalanche is going to be the gaming chain. I mean, and that's a real utility for a real, you know, something like crypto. So those are my two questions. Bitcoin, where's the bridge? And what are you guys doing more to work with these NFTs like chicken? All right. Um, good questions. So uh, on the bridge, that's real close. Uh, so uh, I can't, I won't announce a date or anything, but that, that's that's going to be real close. So you, you should soon be able to uh, take your Bitcoin from the Bitcoin blockchain and move it directly to Avalanche. And, you know, whether you want to keep that Bitcoin on Avalanche and, and, and LP it or borrow against it, um, you know, that's going to be a pretty seamless experience. I'm really excited about um sort of what this can bring. I think this is one of the first of its kind and, you know, it should compete with a lot of the CFI type platforms uh, who try to offer a yield on Bitcoin. So hopefully we'll be able to bring over a lot of that Bitcoin utility, uh, uh, liquidity and, and, and build some utility off it. So I can't give you a date, but it's close. And then on the chicken stuff, you know, it's a, it's a pretty interesting idea, Talon and Robo. I'm curious what you guys think, but, you know, uh, I mean, I, I, I would, I would love to borrow against my chickens. Um, you know, if not the chickens, then, uh, you know, how do we... even my Bitcoin, like I'm just using my Bitcoin to borrow by USD and then I go buy more AVAX, which I put into the liquidity pool on Trader Joe. So it's just, it's just everybody's winning. <laughs> yeah, no, it's nice. You're moving, you're moving collaterals and you're spreading liquidity. It's good. Um, so what do you guys think in terms of the question with respect to kind of uh, being able to, to use these games in an app? like Yeti and be able to integrate a little bit further. Have you guys explored that at a deep level yet? Or is that some territory that, you know, we should start to chop some wood on? Yeah. So in terms of gaming integrations, I think it's an exciting avenue to explore. Um, it's not something we've, we have specific plans for at the moment, um, but kind of for these more blue chip NFTs, I think there is an opportunity in terms of allowing them as collateral in some form of the system. Um, probably not uh, kind of integrated into the current Yeti finance ecosystem or infrastructure, but um, yeah, it's definitely something we can look into uh, a bit later. Yeah, and on that, we've been actually talking to some gaming partners uh, where we've been doing some interesting things like um, pairing their native token uh, or the game token um, with YUSD. Um, and, and in this case, one uh, specific Avalanche native game uh, will also be allowing users to stake their NFT um, to get boosted rewards uh, is kind of their game currency paired uh, pool with YUSD. Um, so even though Yeti Finance is not currently um, equipped to deal with NFT collateralization slash borrowing, uh, we do see you know a lot of major ways to work with kind of the gaming protocols and NFT protocols on Avalanche, especially providing them with kind of a Avalanche native uh, decentralized over collateralized stablecoin.
I mean, you guys could just use Trader Joe's. Is maybe even use the JLP tokens where Trader Joe's is kind of the middleman for you guys to per, you know protect you guys a little from you know. There's a lot of risk, obviously, dealing with gaming tokens, right? So I don't know. Just throw that out there. Yeah, definitely. Um, that's something we definitely can do in terms of um, integrating with uh, Trader Joe LP tokens, where it's like an AVAX um, slash uh, dash the game's native protocol token. Um, that's definitely a possibility for sure. Awesome. Thanks, uh, thanks, Ch AVAX Chicken, for the great questions. Um, so we're going to call up a few other people here just to see if we have some time to get them in. So uh tom we're gonna let you up here to ask a question so <clears throat> once this connects go ahead and try your audio and then uh if you got a question for the yeti team howdy there you go Hello. hi uh, go ahead tom. what's up hey tom? great 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 call i love the project it's my favorite project in all of DeFi right now and uh Thanks for choosing Avalanche. My only question is for on the choice of collaterals that's available. Given that you were so successful in avoiding, maybe narrowly, the UST problem, um, can you say a little bit about the decision to continue to include USDT as collateral in your over-collateralized stablecoin, given the fact that it's clearly an under-collateralized stablecoin? And the only question is how under-collateralized and how bad is the collateral? And just further, that that all stablecoins, sort of, especially the ones like Tether, that that rely on holding assets in the traditional financial system, are a target for regulators. Um, that don't you think this adds additional risk? Only thing I'm concerned about. Thanks for all the great uh, features so far. Yeah, great question, and yeah, thanks for the support, Tom. Um, on the USDT side. Um, kind of the, the rationale, the calculus behind that was USDT is already incredibly integrated into the entire crypto ecosystem. And um, right since 80 billion or something like that in circulation, maybe maybe that number has changed recently, um, but kind of it, it, that type of magnitude. And so um, whether it's the, the centralized side, side of crypto in terms of the exchange integrations or uh, you know cross DeFi, whether it's Aave or Compound, USDT is everywhere. And so... Um, if something were to uh, fundamentally go wrong with USDT, it would probably have a devastating impact on crypto as a whole. Uh, not to sound too bearish, but th that's kind of the, the reality. And so um, the calculus was, you know, if that's going to happen anyway, um, we might as well uh, have it as collateral. And kind of from our perspective, USDT, um, while there is, are some issues around kind of transparency um, from the USDT organization, uh, we do believe that it will remain pegged, and kind of it's a it's a solid asset that um, is is something worthy of being in, uh, used as collateral. And kind of the the recent uh, Luna that that week where we liquidated more than fifty million dollars of USDT from a platform that kind of shows that even if we have some concentration in USDT, if we're, if something were to go wrong, um, we have we have the ability to kind of remove from the system in a in a kind of safe way. Yeah, and this kind of decision to integrate with USDT um, was something that we didn't do it independently. Um, we did it in consultation of our um, kind of security slash um, economic security partner, Three Sigma Labs, um, as well as some kind of um, uh, venture capitalist. Um, we're really big funds with a lot of exposure to USDT um, and protocols in taking it. Um, and we kind of really dug deep uh, in terms of the rationale and what would, ha what would, what would it take uh, for USD to DPEG. Um, and what's actually the li likelihood. Uh, I think there's a lot of kind of different uh, clamoring about, you know, whether the, kind of what, what type of backing do they have as a commercial paper uh, and what's going on. Uh, but kind of the overwhelming opinion for um, kind of major crypto institutions is that um, it is a relatively safe collateral and pretty much um, all of DeFi uh, runs through it, especially for the exchanges like Binance and whatnot. Um, if something were to happen, um, the hope is that um, kind of all these institutions would, would backstop it because it would essentially be a collapse of um, you know, DeFi and crypto. Um, and it sit back the ecosystem for sure for you know, a couple of years. Well, I love the part where you said that, that um, you've already survived uh, a loss of value in USDT. That's fantastic. 
a little bit less swayed by the argument that that's what everyone else is doing and the idea that the whole world will be obliterated what will happen is those those um entities that don't rely on it like coinbase and gemini who you know decided never to incorporate it are gonna come out smelling like a rose like you did with usdt i just like to see it happen again that's all yeah definitely Awesome. Thanks, Tom, for the question. We definitely want to leave time for uh, one more here. Oh, actually, it just popped off. Um, hold on one sec. All right. Let's uh, let's try one more. Here we go. Go ahead, Teddy's. All right. One more question here uh, for the Eddie team. Go ahead. Hello. Yep. Go ahead. Yeah. So, um, one second. Just give me one second. So, guys, um, there is a group of people who came up with this idea of making a world record on Twitter. I think you all um, should like um, support it, like because every entire Twitter space can benefit from it. So, like the way World Record Egg was set up on Instagram. Um, there is a group of people who are set in, who are trying to set up a um, world record um, of a tweet having as many GM on it it, it possibly can, which is I think an insane idea. Um, so like uh, it, it, I don't know if you guys would have to uh, like if you guys would support that or not. Um, like what what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, we do like saying GM. We actually have a, a Discord channel. Um, on our Discord, like, bro. Because so like, I came there, up yeah. with that idea yesterday, <laughs> and I shared it with so many people on the NFT space, and they all just loved it because it can become a new phenomenon, right? Like, like look at the press headlines. Like, somebody created a world record of a tweet getting just a simple like GMs as many GMs as it possibly can. Like, I think the entire space can benefit from it. Like, it can literally start like so much um, noise around it, and and it can connect to mass audiences on because of that, because of the the way we took over for World Record Egg. Like, it was me and my few friends who did it, you know? So, um, just looking for... Yeah, share, me, share me the GM. Share me the GM tweet. Uh, I'll respond yeah. to the GM tweet. Yeah. Yeah. Send, send it over and we'll, we'll all check it out for sure. No, no, so, uh, yeah. so the reason I came here to ask Yeah, just DM. All right, we oh, gotta, yeah, of course. We gotta wrap this <laughs> one up because we got one minute and we gotta send the team off. So, appreciate, appreciate it, Teddy. It's a great idea, so... Um, DM any of us here, DM the Avalanche account, DM uh, the, te- the uh, talent guys, or the uh, yeah, you guys, and we'll, we'll, we'll check it out for sure. But we only got a minute left, so I wanted to definitely make sure that all three of our guests here had a chance to give some uh, final thoughts because we really, really enjoyed the, the talk today. So, uh, yeah, talent, Rebo, anything, any last for the, for the community here? Yeah, I really appreciate everyone coming out. Uh, it's been amazing building on Avalanche and getting so much community support um, usage. Um, at one point, we we're a top 30 DeFi protocol. Um, and it's pretty amazing for, for a protocol that's only a little bit over a month old. Um, so yeah, um, uh, if you guys have any questions, uh, feel free to come into our Discord, uh, Telegram. Uh, our Twitter is Yeti Finance, uh, and our website is Yeti.Finance. Um, yeah. And thank you, Luigi uh, and Cal, for hosting. Thank you, guys. Uh, this is really helpful, and I, you know, I invite everybody to head to their Discord and ask some questions about the protocol, learn a little bit more, and uh, continue to help grow in this ecosystem. Yes, thank you guys so much for joining. Really excited for what you're building. I think the community has really had a really positive um, reaction to to that, and it's really great to see you guys continue to expand. So. Thank you for joining. Make sure to follow them on Twitter, go into their Discord, check out their website. Um, and we'll obviously be sharing any bit major updates from the Yeti team as well on our own channel. So yeah, stay tuned to our Twitter. We got more spaces coming up. We got more announcements coming up. So thank you all for joining and hope everyone has a great rest of their day. See you later. Cheers. Cheers.